Um, it's great to be reminded every time why cultural institutions matter. And I have to say, I'm sure all of us who work in it feel it's, you know, it's, an, it's a, it's a reaff reaffirmation. Um, and of course, hearing uh, what, what it means to make, I mean, change institutions as well, the transformations that we have to make, and we do make, because we're living institutions, yes. you know, they're not um, stayed and, and calcified. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to ask, with your um, work at Tate, how you're thinking um, in relate, I mean, you talked about, you, you spoke about the wonderful new membership scheme, but also in, in terms of sharing collections, knowing that there's a, uh, an exhibition of Tate landscape at Hong Kong Museum of Art as part of the opening of um, that institution after its refurbishment. And it's, it's, it's wonderful um, as institutions that we share collections as well, but also part of that sharing may be um, positioning or repositioning those, those particular Gainsboroughs and Turners in a Hong Kong space and how that has, um, what that feels like. Um, at any point in time, there's probably more Tate on show not in Tate than there is in Tate because there are exhibitions touring all over the world um, all the time. In fact, one of our climate emergency challenges is um, how do we live with the extent of carbon footprint that um, um, that embodies. But that, um, that sharing of works internationally, to me, is, is very, very important um, for at least two reasons. And one is that, um, again, most of the major exhibitions that we make are made in collaboration with other international partners. So the Dora Maar show that just opened at Tate Modern was um, made with the Getty um, as well as the Pompidou. And it's in bringing together those three different kinds of ex expertise that we make a better show. So to me, there's a very interesting moving beyond old competitive models there where we're all on kind of parallel tracks competing with each other for the, um, the prime use of valuable resources. Instead, we're saying, well, if you think about it from the perspective of the public and the research that we'd like to land in the world, um, bringing together rather than competing against one another is much more productive. And no one has enough money, no. so we all need no. to pull so that we can achieve greater outcomes. But then, and then exhibitions like um, our landscape show have been very much about responding to um, local cultural need and wish for um, certain bodies of work, which often surprise us. Uh, so um, th those are relatively traditional works, um, and they speak of a history of English landscape. Naively, I might have said, you know, why is this of interest here? Mm. Or um, it has previously been in China and, um, um, and a similar show in Latin America. Um, but the, um, the local cultural need is that so we don't have that history. And so there's a hunger to know and understand it. Um, so we try to uh, share and present works which expand opportunities, which will be different wherever we go. But we don't try to author it for yeah. And I think it's, it's that's really, really about talking, um, uh, responding to what you were saying before about the audiences also saying um, what what one needs mm. in institutions, and that the institutional reach is much more porous yeah. and fluid. Mm. Um, perhaps you can also talk about the relationship then, in terms of how Tate is working in Pudong in Shanghai. Mm. Yeah. Um, so at the moment we're um, beginning a partnership um, in Pudong, um, which is about um, working towards the creation of an institution. And Tate won't run that institution. Um, our name won't be on the building. Um, for me, the strategy of um, creating outposts um, or institutions on other continents and in other people's contexts is not a valid or valuable one. 2020. 
But we acknowledge that what we have, because of our more than 120 year history and because of the journey that Tate is now on, is that we have um, a knowledge base and, um, and a series of approaches that can be shared. And so our relationship in Pudong is, um, is one which is about um, advice and consultancy and training. And so, I mean, I've worked in Hong Kong for long enough to, to know the language about, it's not about the hardware, it's about developing the software. And so growing um, the body of cultural workers um, and also helping to grow the thinking about the future public. That's what we can, um, pro we can valuably share. Because Tate has been through that, that growth narrative that I taught you. You know, there wasn't an audience for contemporary art in London, really, 25 years ago, and now there is. And it is, I mean, working from um, Asia and knowing that Asia is growing institutions very rapidly, I mean, faster than any other part mm -hmm. of the world, um, which points to a community need mm -hmm. and, and, and so whether that, that's a thought through and um, a, a, a purpose that has the depth of delivery, mm -hmm. maybe not there yet, but that's okay. You have mm -hmm. to start somewhere and, the, and that's happening whether it's in mainland China, in Hong Kong itself, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in, in, in all over Asia. Mm -hmm. It's just a huge hunger. Yeah. And that hunger, I think, is also about the relationship to culture and the arts and people mm. and needing to bridge. Mm. But finding how, how major institutions around the world who have capacity and knowledge are, are thinking through that relationship. Mm. It's very nice to hear that Tate is thinking that via building capacity rather than a particularly brand building exercise. Mm. Of course, sharing collection for all of us is essential. And I think the issue of sustainability is a pressing one for all of us in the world mm. and in whatever industry that we are participating. It's a responsibility yeah. we must make and a commitment that we mm. take. Mm. Um, but I think sharing collections is actually a, a sustainable solution yeah. because it might also suggest people go to the, your local institution to see things that you might not, well, you might choose not to you know, travel. Mm. I, I think um, the first step in sustainability is people giving up cars, mm. is what I've heard. And I think Hong Kong has already done it. <laughs> Hong Kong has done it because so many of us don't own cars. Mm. But the reverse of that is that there is extraordinary and exceptional public transport mm. and it is used and valued. Mm. Um, but that issue, that, that uh, piece of, of work around sustainability is something all of us as institutions we think about and grapple with mm. and consider. Yeah, and I mean, for me, um, thinking about what you're doing at M Plus um, is a really important example because um, Again, when I speak to some of the um, idealists, um, generally younger generation, but not always, um, in my institution, they'll say, well, we should just stop, we should stop international touring, we should stop all international loans. Um, it's the only way to, it will be the only way to achieve 2030 targets around the environment um, and um, to ensure the long-term future of our institution. I said, well, then we would really stop being what we are because those international links, as I said, have been there from the very beginning at Tate. Um, and, um, and I don't believe that because we can't do everything that we shouldn't be doing a lot um, constructively. So I'm starting to think about how we imagine working with and partnering with institutions around the world that have the capacity to um, sustain their ecology. So a partnership with M Plus, another institution that has a collection. Mm -hmm. If we make exhibitions together, we need to think through that we may bring works from the UK um, here to Hong Kong, and then they might have quite a long time mm -hmm. in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And they may move more slowly, um, and they may move around the region, and the exhibitions might um, change in response to each of those contexts. Um, but they, they earn their... Um, they're carbon miles. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and we can be much more strategic, um, but it, inv it involves us re thinking differently mm -hmm. about our institutional habits. Absolutely. And I think that's, um, that's 
essential that mm. we keep testing those. Before I throw to the public, I just wanted to ask one more question about the Turner decision <laughs> and the Turner Prize, because we have been here over the last few days mm. with the uh, for the SIG Prize and the SIG Jury mm. meeting, um, thinking about uh, the first edition, the first, our inaugural edition of the SIG Prize, and then having Maria here, who's come in straight hot off the Turner yeah. decision. Mm. Yeah. Well, I always knew it was going to be quite a tough journey. Um, Turner Prize in Margate, staying overnight there, getting the, um, the train to the airport and flying straight here. But I didn't know quite how tough, given how complex the Turner Prize um, um, decision ended up being, but actually it was brilliant. And the first thing I would say is um, it is the first SIG prize. It's not the first time um, Uli has made the prize, but it's the first SIG version. I wouldn't advise um, having a collective decision and upending the rules of the game your first time over. Um, one of the things that we were saying to journalists, um, some of whom were saying, doesn't, doesn't this break all the rules? Doesn't it... Um, destroy the prizes? Well, no. It's The Turner Prize has been running for 35 years and its rules have changed numerous times. One year they didn't award a prize, one year there was no shortlist. Um, Helen Martin already a few years ago gave her prize money to um, everyone. Um, one year Nick Sorota was nominated. It's been, it's been many things. It's had age limit, it didn't have an age limit. And I point to that because an art prize for living artists has to be about where artists are at the present time. And so when the four artists met in Margate, quite a long time ago now, so at the end of, in the middle of the summer, they met, they debated the state of the world, um, they didn't know each other, they started to talk about their own practice and the exhibition that they would made. And they came to, quite rapidly, to a mutual um, conclusion that any one of them winning would undermine the, the political dimensions of each of their work. And so they came to us with a proposal. They didn't, they didn't say we're going to um, withdraw from the prize or we want to break it. They came to speak um, to Alex at Tate Britain and myself to say, um, can we propose this to the jury? Um, and then they wrote a very beautiful letter that was a kind of... Um, uh, a political um, statement of our times. And um, very slowly, I mean, institutions are quite slow. They have their processes. You have trustees. You have many stakeholders. To, not everybody thought it was a good idea. I can assure you of that. But we went, in the end, um, I felt very strongly, um, and Alex and the jury felt, that this is a prize for artists. If we cannot hear the proposal that the artists are setting out for this. If we can't be open-minded enough to embrace that, we may as well pack up and go home. Because the most fundamental thing about Tate is that it is an institution that is for artists, that it, it gives them a home. You know, their works come into the collection, we make shows with them. We can't then stand and say, oh, I'm afraid we don't agree with your thinking um, because you don't confine, conform to the rules. So it's been an exercise in expanding our imagination. And I think it's been fine. Lovely, lovely. We have about four or five minutes. So are there any questions from the audience that you'd like to put to Maria? Yes. There's a mic coming. Just um, if you can introduce yourself as well. Hi, my name's Dong um, from New York. Um, I forgot my question all of a sudden. The, oh, I guess starting with the sun in the turbine hall, you had mentioned that it was a sort of new paradigm of what art could be. It almost, it's like that art is uh, not so much about the object of it, but actually this collective experience that it's creating. Um, and it seems like a lot of the work you were presenting was that as well. Um, I think the McQueen piece, I imagine it's not really about any individual thing, it's really about the whole collective coming out. And I was curious, I guess a question for both of you, does this, has this been changing as you build a new museum, as you expand an existing museum, change what the physical museum needs to be? Uh, maybe less a place for seeing an object, does it become more of a place just to collect people or create community in any way? I'm just curious if you're looking at the spaces differently. Um, yeah, I think that um, 
we've moved fundamentally beyond um, a point where um, people, if you like, come as individuals just to look at things that are already formed for them. Um, um, and I think that's a really good... It's like we've moved from a, uh, a single narrative of art history. These are the great things, and this is what you need to learn, and then you're done. We've thankfully stepped a long way beyond that. Um, and, and I think there was a period of anxiety where um, people considered that, well, museums have just... Because the famous quote in the UK was, um, it's not a museum anymore, it's just it's a cafe. It's a nice cafe with a museum attached. Um, but I don't ag agree with that. Actually, what I'm seeing is a very active um, sense of engagement that, to me, comes through the complex interrelationship between um, an expanded social media... Uh, universe, which means that people can find out many more things. And again, you, you hear the kind of um, uh, moral panic response, which says, oh, you know, no one's looking at museums anymore because they're all looking at everything on their phone. Look at young people addicted to their screens. That's rubbish. That's not what's happening. They are looking at their screens a lot, and they're also gathering, wanting more spaces that are more interesting because they know... When, in my, when I grew up in the 70s, there were three channels on the television... And that was it. I mean, I still remember when a video machine arrived in our house so you could watch something again. The idea that I had a kind of wider imagination than Lily does is nonsense. Um, and, um, or at least w wider imaginative roots. So as human beings were changing, our sense of what counts as cultural activity is changing. And museums are configured to sort of be spaces to contain things. But artists have been challenging that for decades and decades. And... And I think we can be quite relaxed about the fact that we're sort of both not fit for purpose and really fit for now because people are remaking in our spaces and not because they want to come to the cafe but because they want to debate kind of why something's on a wall, not just what it is. And that seems to me a, a really exciting um, kind of cultural point to be at. From the M plus perspective... Um, what has been a huge advantage for us is that we've been waiting for a building which has really emphasized that we are more than a building because we've already been an active museum in the community already. And to be unfettered has been hugely advantageous. Uh, but it's also a practice. Like I said, it's a, museums are living institutions because of all of us, all of us as museum workers, and we think of um, the institution in, in many ways. It's, it's many different kinds of relationships. And in the 21st century, that is a very amplified reality. And it's, it's you know, I know we've already reached over a million people before we haven't, before we've even opened the institution. I've just got my um, sign to say that we have to wrap up now. So we, we only had one question, but I, I know that we've had a really amazing hour and a half with Maria, and I just want us all to thank her for being such an inspiring leader. Thank you. <laughs>